I have that muted, so I can't hear it. <laughs> but I purposely muted it because it will give I, I hear you on Discord. Chris just started. No, I'm not hearing you. Oh. You want me to intro a book club? Is uh, that what you're asking? I, I got I, got, I took, You had a window. You had a window and you've missed it, but I figured out my microphone. Yeah. Yes, it said no yeah. audio on Twitch. There we go. Oh, yeah. dear. Tell you what. No, I, there was no rhyme or reason behind that one not working. But as always, this is a Wednesday. Wow. What? We got a hype train to kick this off. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Adam has resubscribed for his 11th month. 11th month. Uh, thank you so much, Adam. Miss Necromancers subscribed using their Prime for the fourth month. Thanks, Kate. I can say that directly to you. Thierry's resubbed for the for ten months. That's fantastic. Thank you. Aaron, you've subscribed for nine months. Wowee, that's great. It's resub day. What what? Hi there. Welcome to Book Chat. We are covering King of Scars. Why is my... This happened in the show that I did last night. My micro... My, my camera looked a little fuzzy. And I don't know why. But, um... Let me just press a little button and hope that that... Yeah, there you go. That's... Whoa. It's all going off today. Who's dropping bits? KB Dubs and Adam. Yeah, book club hype. Woo! Alrighty, we'd covered the first half of King of Scars last week. Now we finished the book to chat about it this week. Gory Kills, did you finish the book? I've got to ask her because she started the book. Well, I got her onto Audible and she's trying to read the books with Book Club. And she was a little bit behind. So I'm wondering if she was able to finish it in time. Or uh, we'll, we'll pause for that. Uh, as always, we rank, rate, rank, rate the book when we finish it. Um, so let's talk about not only what it is out of five, but where it fits within the other Grisha verse books that we've read so far. I will go down in order alphabetically, starting with you, Avery, rank and rate. All right. So, um, I would rate this one, um, if they did half stars, I would have done probably a 4.5 out of five, but I ended up rounding up and giving it a five out of five because I really enjoyed, um, just like the way it combined the other two series together and kind of gave us like the fallout of all of that. Um, and I'd say uh, ranking it within the series, I would put it uh, underneath the Six of Crows series, but ab uh, above the Shadow and Bone series. Got it. Yeah, I have a feeling we're going to be hearing a lot of that. But five out of five, loving that. And also, Gory is about two thirds of the way through. So we're just going to spoil the crap out of this for you, love. Uh, Colleen. Rank and rate. Um, I would uh, I can't agree mostly with what Avery said. Um, I would rank or uh, rank it. Well, nothing can compare to Six of Crows, um, but it's better than Shadow and Bone. I think she um, by having the um, a different perspective, uh, first person just didn't work as well for her. So yeah. I think that puts this book ahead, but I'm I'm not sure um, three and a half or four, maybe a four. It gets pretty exciting, and I like the way they build up um, Zoya's backstory, um, but uh, not nearly as much as Six of Crows. Yeah. Agree. What did you give it out of five? Um, three and a half for four. Okay. All righty. Yeah. Uh, hello there, Rod. Very good morning to you too. Aaron, rating and ranking. Uh, I would, uh, rate it about four and a half out of five only because of Isaac. Not because I hated him, but because I think that was a very weird story arc that we went through on the, his dream. I guess we'll get in discussions later. Yeah. Uh, as far as like how I rank it within the series, I would still say like everybody here, Six of Crows duology, just a little bit below so far with that. 
for King of Scars, and I'm sure once we finish it, it'll be about even. And then Shadow and Bones is still less, but I would still like it just because of the world building yeah. for Shadow and Bones. Love it. Nox. Well, I said last week that I loved this book until the last two pages. Yeah, so. I was waiting for I thought of you when I was walking around my neighborhood, and they read the last line, and I was like, there it is. I was not drunk, there it, is. it was I, in the morning. So <laughs> I took the book club action and threw my book. <laughs> That's, that makes me very proud. <laughs> so out of five, it was up to the last part of the book I was thinking about, about a four, and... Uh, it dropped to about a two and a half for me after that wow, revelation. Wow, that one thing. I just felt like it was just so contrived, and it's like, no. <laughs> I am going to talk about the conveniences of this book, for sure, for sure. We got a level one hype train. Thank you, everyone, for that. That's just a lovely way to start start the stream. Apparently, there's, like, new emotes that are being delivered to supporters, so that's lovely. Um, Lisa, have we got you? We're ranking and rating. Yeah, can you hear me? Hey, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm probably the same as Avery. I, I'd say probably a 4.5 rounded up to a 5. Um, but I do still think the Six of Crows duology would be my favorite out of all of them. Fantastic. Uh, we've got a Trisha Hirschberger raid. She's raiding with a very big party. And so STS is dropping some gift subs into the community. Hi there, Stephen. Hi, everyone who's deciding to follow as well. I will give individual shout outs for that. Every Wednesday, we try to make it like a book chat night. The first two Wednesdays, we'll be covering a book. We've been actually covering the Griefiverse series, which is Shadow and Bone. So we've done the trilogy for that on oh, KP Dove's dropping some gift sub t too. So Fizzle, uh, Gandalf the Grape, Mittens, Rom Rom, Moth to Light, and sh soon you all get a, a gift sub thanks to KP Dubs. I should probably read out the other ones as well. My gosh, I'm so sorry. This is like, my feed is lit up. Uh, lesser, lesser Cell, Lesser Kel, uh, thank you so much for the follow. Uh, STS gifted subs to uh, Dabby Gappa, Lantern Genie Murky, M the Cartographer, hello, hello, Small uh, Blonde, I believe, Silver Pixel, so you all get free subs as well. Welcome to the Geek Bomb community. Uh, if you got a gift sub, feel free to use all the emotes that have just been unlocked for you. Uh, big hi to the Dragon Riders. If you're not uh, following Trisha's Discord, you can do that. Um, I know that all the details are sort of in her chat. Trisha, do you have a Discord link? If not, find Trisha's Discord. The Dragon Riders are a great bunch. Um, our Discord info is right here if you want to join Geek Bombs. Uh, a big thing that we do, we're not just focused on video games. We talk about all of the things that fall under playing video games watching TV and film, and reading books. Uh, and I love reading books, which is why we do book chat. Uh, because if you were a fan of Nerdist's book club, we did that every single Wednesday night where we would read one book and it would divvy up the discussion over the course of the month. Um, and now we are just having one chat a month. So it left a lot of Wednesdays open. So I decided to jump in there and tackle books that are on my to read list. So if, out of all the new people joining us, have you read anything in the Grishaverse, whether it's Shadow and Bone or Six of Crows or the first book of this duology, King of Scars? If this is something that interests you, stick around. We are getting our chat on. Uh, and what's really cool about this book club is that uh, the backers on Patreon have access to the Discord. And when we chat about the Geek Bomb book chat, they're actually in the discussion right now. I've practiced this with them. Let's hope we do better. They will say hello on three. One, two, three. Hello. 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 Uh, yeah. So we actually hello. get to have like an, in, like a, not necessarily, it's not quite face to face, but it's voice to voice conversation as close to book club proper as we get BYO drink as we have here. Uh, we're just going through ranking and rating the book at the moment. So we are ranking King of Scars out of, uh, sorry, rating it out of five. And then we're ranking it within the other books in the Grishaverse. Uh, so 
Chris, I don't, you usually don't participate, but if you want to write your response down, I can read it out. Um, Michelle, are you there? And the cartographer, you now have a, you're a gift sub into the Twitch. Uh, do you want to rank and rate? Hello. Uh, yes. I um, very stupidly thought we were reading one book per week and I had to miss last week. So I'm super ahead and I've been scrambling trying to figure out where we are. Oh, we're covering um. the entire book for this one. So this week, last week was the first half of this book. Oh. This week's the second half of this book. So anything's fair game if we're talking King of so Stars. So I've read... I've read the whole duology. I was frantically listening to it um, wow. on accident, sort what's, of. What yes. speed? So, Wait, I've got but, so many questions because it's been a hot minute since we've spoken. What speed do you listen to on Audible? Yes. And my big question for you as well, especially because of Six of Crows and you planted a seed about Matthias's Audible narrator being like, oh, hello, which definitely I agree with. Um, how was it only yep. having the one this time? I really miss um, the the cast. Um, I think I think for me that it experience is so enjoyable. I and I love audio plays. I think that this could be a great audio play with full cast and sound effects and you know all the songs being properly sung and stuff. Um, so that was. I mean, the the narrator is great. So it's yeah. it's not a huge loss. I really like her. I was listening to it at one point three speed, which is. I usually just listen to, I try to listen to it at whatever normal speed it is, unless I really got to book it, but because oh, I was boy. trying to cram two huge books into two weeks. Oh no. I yeah, was we technically basically do a book speed a listening. Month, a book a month as well. Yeah. Oh, you poor thing. Sorry. I, Did you still enjoy I, it's, it? I think it's just one of those things that I, yeah, 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 yeah. I really, I really liked it. I thought it was, um, I thought it was great. And um, this is three I, times, by the I way. I agree with everyone else about. You ready? What's that? This is three, th three times. Oh, not three times. One point three. <laughs> oh, I thought you were listening to it at three times, and I'm like, well, you are blessed. No. With audible prowess, because that's like, gotcha, gotcha. One point no. three. I hear you now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it, which is more, it's faster than I like to listen to it because I, I just like listening to books. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I agree with everyone else though on like rank and rating. A um, little bit below Six of Crows. I just miss those characters, I think. It's yeah. not that I, you know, like these characters more or less. It's just that I, I really miss them, I guess. So, and their perspectives. Um, I think that's why it's a little bit below uh, The Six of Crows, but I think it's also a great read. Very thrilling. Fantastic. So great to have you back. Sorry that you absolutely crammed all these books, uh, but you are ahead for next month, so sorted that's for okay. that. Um, by the way, Chicken yep, Burrito. I'll just re-listen. You are going to – I mean, I listened to it twice over. The first time just to hear it and the second time to make notes, and I like that because I always miss things, especially because I'm listening. 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 Um, Chicken Burrito, thank you so much for using your Prime to sub to Geek Bomb. Welcome to the, the Geek Bomb family here, the Maud Squad as we call it. Um, Schnes XXX1980, a big hello. Thank you so much for the follow and welcome to you too. Um, yes, we do have a Discord. We are talking about all these fun things over there as well. We've got the link in the chat for you too. Uh, Steven says, I like the look of this book because I like gold. <laughs> I love gold. Um, I love the comments of telling me what you're currently reading. I'm all about entertaining the chat and talking about what books you're currently reading too. Um, Aaron says, having Nina trying her best uh, to imagine how Kaz would have handled things helped at least, even though the rest of the group isn't there. I agree with you completely. Um, I, uh, I, I will weigh in. Uh, we've got a couple more people though. Kate, rank and rate for me. You there, Kate? Ms. Necromancer? I'm here. Sorry. I had to get to another window. I've got like 10 open. That's all right. Uh, I give it like four out of five. Yep. I would have given it higher, except Isaac wasn't the problem for me. It was 
the Nikolai and Zoya stuff, it was just a little... All the other magic seemed very, not like scientific, but more kind of rooted. Like when they talked about like small science and stuff like that, it had a more rooted explanation. And then this was just like, we're going to outer space and fighting like laser dinosaurs. So it's just like, it lost me a little because it was so out there from the rest of the Grisha magic. So that was the part that's like kind of knocked it down from five. I want to hold that thought because we're definitely going to be chatting about that as well. Uh, Jimmy, let's rank and rate. Hello. Yes. Uh, so I would say that this book is tied with the previous book in terms of ranking. Like, uh, it has its strong parts and it has its weak parts. You know, like, uh, I'm not, not the biggest fan of... Uh, um, Isaac, I think is his name. Yeah. He just seems like, he just seems like, uh, a fraud. Like he's really trying to hold on to. He'll be the to first it. to tell you that he is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's a little disappointing, but yeah, I would say that the six of crows though is definitely number one. It's just like the best book. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Um, everyone in the chat's talking about the books that they're currently reading uh in hashtag reading on the discord clever girl said that uh, she's just started reading this the physics of star wars and it's written by an actual doctor who i uh, believe you know is a, specializes in physics so i love that i was like man this is when a really really smart nerd gets to nerd out about shit that they love like hell yeah i'm so about that that is my thing Chris says, I, I didn't read the book. I've been writing too much to read, but I'm following and will come back to King of Scars at some point. Um, for me, I everyone's saying Six of Crows and then a little bit behind that, it's King of Scars. I'm wondering whether King of Scars or the Shadow and Bone series are like kind of a tie to, for me. Um, and then Colleen reminded me that Shadow of Bone is written in the first person and it really did hurt the writing of the book being in the first person. But I was more excited to listen to what was happening next in Shadow and Bone and that trilogy than I was in this book. This book just hasn't enraptured me in the same way that the Grisha first does. And I think that setting up the world and the world building and the characters, even though I couldn't necessarily relate to any of them in Shadow and Bone, I was really interested in how they were fleshing out these Grisha powers, the school, um, who the Darkling is, uh, the, the political intrigue, but then also this personal development of, I'm just an orphan girl and now I've got so much power. But like, I actually kind of really liked the arc and that story. In this, and then you had Six of Crows, which is such amazing writing, an amazing ensemble, uh, people that you genuinely care about. Uh, and I believe that half the people in our book club right now would say that they would take a bullet for. Um, precious, wonderful, incredibly well developed uh, characters with a now seasoned writer that's doing some of her best work in a much more intriguing genre, which is instead of high fantasy or I guess steampunk fantasy, uh, it's heist and it's um, uh, sort of like mafia-esque, you know, it's the nitty gritty underworld and it's so much, it's just so fantastic. And then in this one, it just hasn't quite grasped what it's trying to do. It's telling stories from different areas they're not necessarily working together as much as a team. Uh, it, if, if Six of Crows is talking like about a party and a campaign, let's talk D&D because &D, I'll always bring it back to that somehow. Uh, you've got everyone who's got their own unique class that works together in a team where all of those skills combined makes a formidable sort of force in a way. In this book, they split the party. You're not supposed to split the party. Yes, Colleen, it jumps around too much. Um, and then the other thing that it does, and I'm going back to what Kate was saying, which is why I was like, hold tabs on that. They, they make the rules, they set up the world, they tell you what the Grisha power is, and it seems, I know what you're saying, grounded, you know, rooted. It's got that um, believability behind it. And then they amplify it, sorry for the pun, uh, but in Six of Crows with a chemical substance that enhances their ability. So we kind of got the super soldier serum stuff happening. 
And then in this one, they break all the rules that have been set up. And it got to the point where I was putting angry emojis in my notes because I was getting a bit bothered by it. Um, Aaron is saying this book does feel very reactionary rather than uh, like the characters have any true agency. Maybe aside from Nina, who feels uh, like she's trying to take too much agency. Aaron, jump on. I want to hear more about that. Talk me through that comment. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, Nikolai is basically trying his best to to keep the wheels moving in his country. He knows exactly how crappy his situation is. He's trying to put on a good face and a good front to like, you know, keep the lights on. And everybody's trying to help him do that. Except every time he feels like he's getting ahead, something else happens that forces him to play defensive rather than offensive. Whereas and now Nina, she's off doing her own thing, trying to take care of her grief with Matthias. But then she just keeps like demanding like, okay, we need to do this, we need to do that. Except she has a commander who's like basically keep telling her like, "Hey, you're not in charge." Remember? Oh yeah, no, I know. By the way, I'm doing this thing. You did what? <laughs> yeah. But basically, felt like her entire arc was just like she is constantly being reminded she is not supposed to do this, even though she's right. She does need to remember she's part of a team. She's basically being too much like Kaz. <laughs> yeah. She learned too much in the in the worst way. <laughs> Yeah, but Kaz was able to keep a team. He just positioned himself as the one that everyone listened to and Nina doesn't have that luxury. Um, but I hear what no. you're saying with, with that one. Uh, Avery, I feel like at this point, I'm so invested in the Grisha verse as a whole that I'm more willing to accept some of the things that I would have judged more harshly if I cared about the world less. Avery, jump on and tell me a little bit more about that. Did you feel at times that it's like, uh, here's, we're going to skip way over, but this is the, the example that I had that really irked me. At the end of Shadow and Bone Trilogy, Jenya, who is the best tailor, she's one of the few, but she is the, like, the number one, was able to change Alina's hair from white to red for a day or two at most. And that's all it does. So it was in incredibly temporary tailoring effects. Nina had to be bumped up on Jurda Parem to be able to change Wylan into Kuei. And that was, spoilers if you haven't read Six of Crows, shoot. Um, and that was the side effects of a really, really like destro destructive drug. And now <laughs> Hannah, who has barely even registered that she's a Grisha, is now learning to permanently tailor as well, or at least sort of do some of the tailoring. And Nina, you know, Jenya did Nina's, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and she's not on Parem. So that was just, mm. but what does everyone think about sort of like this establishing of the law and then the complete obliteration of it? Do we care? Are you feeling my wrath? Knox. I think it's interesting that you're seeing in this book that the Grisha can actually do a lot more outside their own specialization, but that's really with the arc of Zoya learning about her powers and being able to bring thunder and lightning and that sort of thing. And I, I agree. It was a stretch to say, wait a minute, hey, they're doing what? And because the other regular Grisha, it's like they've been trained their whole life to just work with one element. And now I'm, I'm with you. It's like, that's not believable. Yeah, it just, the inconsistencies to the, the world building I, I struggle with from time to time. Um, Game Wizard says, is physical alterations permanent rather than hair color and wrinkle treatment? Or was any alteration supposed to be on a time limit? I got the impression that any alteration was on a time, <laughs> uh, that any alteration was on a time limit. I thought that it was always a sense because I, you know, it's too OP otherwise. You know, if you can permanently change looks, then no wonder Grishas are deemed such a threat because you are literally like altering someone's identity. And in this world of political and spy intrigue, like you're weaponizing people in such a profound way. That's why I always thought that it was a very temporary thing. Stephen says, you guys really get into these book discussions. I finally found a channel like that on Twitch. Yay! We do a bunch of different things. I play video games as well. Uh, I do team ups. We do podcasts sometimes on here. But there will be, when I want to talk about a book, I will 
cancel, I will rule, block out two hours to chat about a book. I used to always hear your voice during Trisha's co-ops. That's it. Yeah, Trisha and I used to play quite a lot together, especially Outriders, which I convinced her to finish and we did, which is great. Uh, the increased abilities that Zoya learned was the least disturbing to me. Agree, agree, Colleen. That actually made sense. She was originally one of the more powerful Grisha. And we also established that when you go into the college, you learn about everything and then you specialize as one. I don't think you were only ever gifted with one ability. I think there was just one that you excelled at. And so that's what you kind of focused on. Yeah. Right? Um, Colleen? I, I think it even went a little beyond that. Um, it's sort of like the ancient hidden um, uh, lore that... Uh, you know, we're always looking for that ancient mystery that was lost. So I kind of saw what she learned as falling into that category, that there was a lot of um, lost lore that the Grisha just weren't even tapping into. Yeah, and that makes absolute sense. You know, if there's a, uh, a power that's been around for centuries and centuries, it's, uh, you know, watered down, it's... Um, some of the aspects of it are long forgotten. And I, I really, I liked the exploration of that. I liked Juris, the dragon being like, when we started, like I, I had all this power and I guess I'm the one that sort of created what Grisha were and I could do this and I can do all these things. And um, when you were to kill an animal, you know, instead of killing an animal and then taking a part of them to become an amplifier, you instead became and entwined with the spirit and became the animal. I was like, that's really, really cool. Like, I love this forgotten um, magic that was there. Um, so that worked for me. I think that it's all of a sudden, it's the, you know, Nina's ever uh, um, evolved powers I'm still on the fence about, but, you know, Hannah having absolutely no official training, being able to do things that, uh, the most skilled tailor can do. I'm a little bit like, mm, no. Uh, Michelle says, I had kind of put the power increase down to them being older and using their powers more and that Nina's more permanent tailoring was probably a long process for Jenya. Uh, but I think that that might have been my mind filling in the blanks for the logic. There it is. We saw Jenya turn um, Wylan back from Kuwait to his um, looks. Um but yeah, it, it sounded and or seemed like it took a lot of concentration and a lot of time. Whereas I believe like Nina was just like, boom, you're done. Good. Bye. Um, but I also really relate to the fact that you said, yeah, I might've just been filling in the blanks just to make do, uh, just to not get bogged down in it all. Uh, because we still have a hundred viewers and I'm convinced that not all a hundred people have read this book. Uh, let's just pause King of Scars conversation to talk about what book you are currently reading. I want to celebrate all reading. Um, I'm going to go through book club and book chat as well. I'll go from bottom to top this time. So Jimmy, is there another book that you're currently reading or have read to put you on the um, spot? Well, well, I'm kind of reading, um, cause I'm a big flash fan, Barry Allen all the way. Yep. And so I'm reading old school flash. Like I'm reading the omnibuses, like the really compacted information it's like a textbook almost and it's like you know how how he started and blah, 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 you know like silver age golden age blah, 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 you know like so it's like it's it's really diving deep into the flash lore love it you know because who doesn't love flash <laughs> i think he's the says, best superhero ever steven says the flash Wow. <laughs> I am picking it up just from writing in the comment. Um, Kate, what you reading? Is there another thing that you've been reading lately? I'm reading a couple things. I have one that I'm reading. It's an arc of a book that comes out next week, actually, called She Who Became the Sun by Shelley Parker Chan. It's like a queer retelling Mulan meets Song of Achilles of the rise of the Ming Dynasty. Wow. And it's really good so far. And I'm also reading a book called Quackery, which is a nonfiction book about, like, just the history of weird medical treatments. What? Okay. That's awesome. Like what? <laughs> uh, it's broken out into chapters. So the chapters that I finished was talking about using, like, mercury in things and how common it was, like, in, you know, pills and just, like, you know, the mercury poisoning and all that kind of stuff. And 
and um, like bloodletting and talking about like humors, how they believed that different fluids in your body was the imbalance. That's why you were sick. So, you know, they'd make you vomit or they'd make you like, you know, shit yourself or, you know, bloodletting to even out your humors. Yeah, wow. So it's all this like this kind of stuff and using like opium and electroshock and like all the kind of stuff like that. Yeah, I was only just hearing about um, like the frontal lobotomy and that the guy who just like who the doctor that created that, I think, in like the 1940s, 30s, 40s, ended up getting like a Nobel Peace Prize. And that it was basically ruled out within like by the time the 60s and 70s came about, except America was the last country to stop doing those. Yikes. Um, I am reading always more books. Um the books that I, I'm going to, as we know, noticed for this month, we're doing Star Wars Light of the Jedi, which I'm on the cover of, and I'm really excited to read that one. <laughs> um, I'm also reading a book by Christine Whelan, Finding Your Purpose. Uh, I've never really known what my purpose is. Like, I'm great at goal setting, but whatever, like, is higher than that. And I'm just really, really into self-growth and, like, all these books to kind of better myself. Uh, that's what 2020 started. I'm still on that road. Uh, and then... I've this is my problem I start series so I started Wheel of Time two years ago I then this year uh well five or six years ago I started Miss Born and only got halfway through it so this year finished Miss Born by Brandon Sanderson but now I'm literally one book in of two really big series and I'm like Ugh. so I'm gonna figure out which number book of second book of those series that I'm going to read. I'm really enjoying Mistborn. Um, and I know that Wheel of Time can be a slog, but when it's good, it's amazing. So that's my road ahead. Uh, Kate says, you've got blood in your ghosts. Here, take this cocaine. <laughs> oh, ghosts in your blood. Oh, wow. <laughs> take this cocaine. I was going to give me some, a few more ghosts in my blood. Uh, damn, I dyslexia my way out of that joke landing. <laughs> that sounds like something I would do. True Scorn, thank you so much for the bits. Um, I saw before the book that you're currently reading, Patrick Rothfuss' The Lightning Tree. The Lighting Tree, sorry, which is a, a day in the life of Bast. I'd love to hear another line about that. Um, this was a part of a short story series that I believe George R.R. R. Martin asked him to be a part of. And he originally wanted to do it about Ori uh, with the silent... With the, I can, it just, if I don't see the name of it in front of me, the, who's going to help me in book club? Patrick Rothfuss book, The Slow Regard of Silent Things. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Thank you, all three of you. <laughs> the Slow Regard of Silent Things. I was initially supposed to be uh, that short story, but then realized that the version of the book that he wanted to write was not rogue like because that was like the overarching thing was ro theme was rogue and so he ended up doing um this one the uh lighting tree lightning i thought it was lightning tree maybe um but chris if you're in the chat i want to hear what you rank rated it out of five that would be amazing and if you haven't seen the chat that i did with patrick rothfuss which went for two and a half hours about the slow regard of silent things uh i keep calling it the silent knife but i realize that that is the subtle knife from another series that i've read um the great hunt uh on wheel of time is really good especially compared to the first book says aaron Ooh, but lisa's saying well of ascension which is the second book in the mistborn series Gory, I don't know if you're still there. We may have to get a poll going. Am I going to continue the Wheel of Time series with book two of Wheel of Time or am I going to continue the Mistborn series with book two of Mistborn? Mm, chat, let me know if this is your jam. Uh, Chris says that seven out of ten, seven and a half out of ten for The Lighting Tree. Um, da -da 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 -da. I'm here, will do, love it. The Blinding Knife, Black Prism. I am. I'm confusing all my titles. I'm one-upping the dyslexia happening here because I'm with my people. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I can't read that comment. Um, alrighty. So has everyone spoken about the book that they are currently reading? Who's next? Michelle. 
and the cartographer is there a book that you're currently reading michelle there she is sorry the unmute frozen for a little bit um the only other thing I've been reading is I just finished it, it is the b bullet journal method because I'm trying to get more organized. How's, how are you finding it? <laughs> um, I have I found it really helpful. Um, I'm not doing the whole method, but I'm using, um, you know, it's meant to be adaptable. So uh, I've been picking out what's been useful so that it's, it's definitely... Um, it really just sort of focuses you on on the whole planning thing. Jimmy says organization hype. Uh, I think it was um, Atomic Mari who did a series uh, um, or a few videos. I believe it was her who introduced me to bullet journaling and how it changed their life. So I'm always very intrigued about it. I am just so terrible at consistently doing something that requires more than three minutes of effort. So good on you, uh, Lisa. What's your, what's your reading at the moment? Um, I just started the third book of the Folk of the Air series by Holly Black, which is uh, Queen of Nothing. I've heard good things and about I'm Holly also, Black. Also slowly, yeah, I'm also slowly working my way through like a bind up of a couple of short stories from like three different authors that are parts of their series. How many books have you read this year so far, would you say? <laughs> Um, I'm already over a hundred. <laughs> wow. That's so good. That's so great. I just, I'm so, it's so inspirational, honestly. I think I ended up only having like 75 for all of last year. Um, so just hearing that, it's just great. I mean, that's one way to look at it. <laughs> I am impressed. Uh, Miss Necromance has read Miss Born and loved it, but hasn't read Wheel of Time. Clever Girl has read Wheel of Time, but not Miss Born. Uh, True Scorn says, oh, don't make me vote. Will of Time versus Miss Bourne. Whew, I think you'll like Miss Bourne better. <sighs> um, yeah, interesting. But then I think, uh, Aaron, you commented earlier as well on that, saying it's a uh, great hunt on Wheel of Time is really good, especially compared to the first book. So that's interesting. But then Lisa says that Miss Bourne's only three books. Uh, it's a lot less than Wheel of Time. What are the results? We can still vote at the moment. More people are saying Mistborn. Mm, okay. <laughs> Don't got to twist my arm. Um, oh, Kate, you started reading Wheel of Time, but you just read the first Mistborn. Yikes, we really are all in this together, huh? Oh, wait, you started I read reading... All of, oh. I read all of the first Mistborn book. I really liked that book. So I read I. a little bit of the first of Wheel of Time, and I was like, no. <laughs> no it was a slog huh like it just kept going uh adam vision is raiding hello ding dongs how are my ding dongs uh tawny l just swooped straight in saying miss born is lovely hi everyone every wednesday well, most wednesday this is complicated but let me spell it out for you the first two wednesdays of the month we are covering a book we're getting through the grisha verse books which is in the shadow and bone series we did the trilogy for nerdist a couple uh, like around the time this show came out and then i continued it on for geek bomb with the uh, six of crows duology which we've covered and now we're getting stuck into the King of Scars duology and we've just finished reading the first book. Last week, we spoke about the first half of the book. This week, we're talking about the second half of the book. Tony L says, I'm a huge reader. I came in at a great time. If you are joining us, let me know what book you're currently reading because here at Book Chat, we chat books and I truly believe that more people need to be reading and if there was like an outlet to talk about it, then maybe more people will be inclined or if there was accountability in place with a deadline to read it in time, then maybe people are more likely to prioritize it and put their phones down at night. Oh, that one's a hard one for me. Uh, I personally like to listen to my Audible while I'm going for a walk with my dog every morning. Oi! Hi, Farwell. Uh, Tony L, you're currently working through the Witcher series right now. Funny story. I believe it was the end of 2019 when we did book club just on our Discord. Who did that? <laughs> I 
<laughs> Adam, Adam Vision just gifted a sub to I can't read book. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Start reading, Adam. Reading's really cool. <laughs> All the cool kids are doing it. We love reading over here. <laughs> Me no read good. <laughs> Sounds like Titan. Oh, dear. Um, oh, really? Oh, clever girl. We'll get to you on that one. I'm so excited because I know Kate's a big fan. There it is, all caps. Yep. Massive big fan of that. Hey, Price Must Flow. How are you? What book are you reading at the moment? Uh, I've got, for those joining... Um, our Discord, there's a call section on there that's only for Patreon backers and we've got a book club tier. So when we do book chat, you can actually jump into the Discord chat to talk about it, which we're doing right now. Um, I believe, is it, Lise, did we get to? Yes, we did. Knox, what book are you reading at the moment? Well, I've downloaded the Star Wars book for the Nerdist Book Club and I'm just about to start take part of that. I hadn't yet gotten, I've gotten the... Uh, Rule of Wolves, but I'm waiting till we're reading it together. Yes, I'm the same because I want it fresh in my mind. But I'll be there with the Notice Book Club. Uh, is it Light of the Jedi? I believe it is. They all start to sound the same. Light of the Jedi, Return of the Jedi. Yes. Yeah, Last is this Jedi. Rising? Jedi Rising? Something like that. Yeah, right. I don't know, you but I, I know I got the right book. Okay, good. Um, Aaron, what book are you reading at the moment? I'm kind of flipping back and forth between... To one, I'm going to be going immediately into King of Wolves uh, next, but rule of uh, on the side. Rule. Okay, sorry. No, we're <laughs> just saying those these series they start sounding the, the same. Sequel to King of Scars, we'll just say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but on the sideline, I'm actually reading a like sort of anthology uh, series from the Five Nights at Freddy's games. They've actually written stories based on that game. Oh no! Way. They're actually really good. They yeah, uh, and they're, they're not. A little scary, but I like. Oh my god, I cannot. You know, I need the lights on when I, you know, have this on. But uh, yeah, they're like, and it's not like the the game maker who does. It. He gets other authors to make like three main short stories and like a little kind of mini short story that kind of connects throughout the entire book series. There's like nine so far, but they're really short, like maybe two and a, you know, two hundred fifty pages at most. Across three stories. It's like the modern day R.L. Stein books. <laughs> yeah, it's called uh, Five Nights at Freddy's uh, Fazbear Frights. Say that five times fast, please. No. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Um, hello, fat black Patrick Swayze. He's in here saying reading is fundamental. Hell yeah. How are you, by the way? It's so lovely having you in the chat. Bear8642 says given world of time suggestion enjoyed malazan series given world of time suggestion enjoyed malazan series though peter beagle's last unicorn excellent book to discuss we really got to do last unicorn in this book chat huh like i think we've all just consecutively decided in the hashtag reading part of the discord which you should definitely join in it's a perk if you're a backer um, we've all either read it, wanted to read it, or um, have nominated it for a, an upcoming book. Maybe it can be our palate cleanser after the Grisha series. We've only got one more book and then we're done. Um, and then, yeah, we're already thinking about the next books that we want to do. Dresden Files, Mistborn, Wheel of Time. We may have to just break them up. We can't do them, like, we can't do 16 books in a row. That's just some heavy lifting because if you're going to binge books like that like you're reading one or two books sort of like maybe three books a month because you're just churning through them uh and if you're Thierry you've read the entire Dresden Files series I think you listen to them three times in about six months three times over hmm. uh, so bear with us bear because I think we're going to do uh, Last Unicorn and there's a lot of hype around that um, STS says, I'm very happy about all the Witcher content Netflix is giving us. So am I. We got an animated series. Uh, I think we're getting season two in December. Mm, Henry Cavill in some leather pants. Don't sexualize men, Maud. Mm. Henry Cavill is delicious. Um, Frankie Muse says, I'm reading the Mothman prophecies on Audible right now. Frankie Muse, you're in good company here. I truly believe that reading a book does count if you are listening to it. It's just someone reading it to you. 
does it take a different mental capacity? Yeah, a little bit. I know that my mind wanders when I'm listening to Audible, but I can listen to it faster. I can go back if I realized I've like started drifting out. Uh, but it means I can consume books while doing something else at the same time, which is so good for me. I like that a lot. Stephen says, do you guys really want to know? I'm rereading my book for like the 40th time in 20 years and every time I find something wrong with it. Uh, tell us about your book, Stephen. We got an author in the chat. Tony L says, if you're reading Mistborn next, I will 100% be here. I love that series and I would love to hear your take. Ooh, so here's the thing. I just finished the first book and so I would want to read the second book. But if we're going to do it for a book club, we have to start at the very beginning. And at the moment, we are one out of two books through this duology by Lee Bardugo. If you've seen Shadow and Bone, get on over here. It's a lot of fun. Uh, Rachel would love Last Unicorn. It's got it. We got it. We got to get it done. We have to do that. Uh, Adam says, I'm the person that watches the movie and then tries to pretend they read the book. Mm. Adam. Adam, you just don't, don't pretend to read it. Just, just, just be a movie guy. Just be a movie guy. The unicorn is the national an animal for Scotland. That's awesome. Uh, Colleen says, I read The Last Unicorn so many years ago that it will be like reading it for the first time. Love that feeling when you know it's good, but you forget what happens. So good. Game Wizard says, uh, we could potentially get a watch party with the animated film. Hell yes. Yes, we'd absolutely do that. And we've got the capacity to do that over at Geek Bomb. So yes. Uh, yes, Tony L, I agree with you. Telling Adam that the books are always so much better. Do we really read two books a month? Wow, says Stephen. We will read a book the first half of the month for book chat here at Geek Bomb. And then we dedicate the second half of the month to read the book for Nerdist Book Club in which I am one of the hosts of. And that's been, if you count Alpha Book Club, a long running series that we do. But I will also be listening and reading other books on the side because reading is sure much better. Uh, Lisa says, am I the only one who doesn't know anything about The Last Unicorn? I believe the movie came out in like the 80s. I never watched it. I'd only ever heard about The Last Unicorn because of Rachel. So do not feel bad about this. This is like, you know, undiscovered territory terrain for me as well. Uh, but we'll be in it together. How's that? Uh, we can do the Wheel of Time show and movie. It's kind of like what we did for Shadow and Bone. I really liked it. Yeah. Uh, it's very ableist not to count audiobooks as reading. I have to agree with you there. I mean, it's the same words. It's the same kind of content. I, I think sort of judging how one consumes it can, yeah, can be ableist. There you go. Uh, Stephen says, I'm listening to some great audiobooks by Joanna Penn. Since audiobooks do count, it's a book. Yeah. Um, P. Matthew says Star Wars Ahsoka and I love it. I've heard really good things about that as well. I would, I need to get into that too. Uh, Tony L says I read really fast. I usually finish books in a couple of days. You are in good company here. Adam says I live for Maud's disapproval. <laughs> Stick around. <laughs> I'm sure we can find something else in our time. <laughs> Adam Vision says you'll live for a long time then. <laughs> Eek. I'm so sweet. Uh, Stephen telling us about the book says my book is called the destroyer of worlds an answer to every question it features gods and goddesses from major myths and legends taking sides in a war between alien dinosaurs and cosmic dragons wow this is on point with what happens in this book which shouldn't happen in this book it should happen in your book but it happens in this book it's very interesting it is a four-time award-winning and Pulitzer Prize nominated novel Trisha owns it wow I am so glad you bragged here. That was very welcome. Um, doesn't she also do an audio sample of it? Oh, wow. Trisha actually read for the character Aphrodite in the novel. That's so cool. Yeah, righty. Uh, Colleen, you'd mentioned it in the chat before, but what book are you currently reading? Um, I usually read about four books at a time. So I've started the physics of Star Wars 
I'm, I also started going back through um, the Dresden files. Yes, I'm... and? <gasps> Do you like it? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, it gets better, I think, as you go. I love um, them. Especially listening. So, Are you listening yeah, or reading, I really though, Colleen? Like... What's that? Are you listening or reading? I'm reading those. I'm listening to The Lies of Locke Lamora. Oh my gosh, and that's so I'm weird also... because I've listened to all of Dresden Files and I've only read The Lies of Locke Lamora, which I should have right behind me. I usually pull it out when we talk about it. Um, I don't know how the audible is for Lies of Locke Lamora, but I've, have you heard me rave on and on and on about how good the Dresden Files audiobooks are? No, but it sounds like I have to check them out. Colleen, have you ever watched Buffy? Oh, yeah. So the guy, the actor who plays Spike, his name's James Masters. He narrates the Dresden Files and he has, he has spoiled me so much that other narrators just basically dissipate in his shadow because he's so good. Farwell says, I love the Dresden Files. They're so good. But the way that he narrates, he doesn't just read words. He tells the story and it's some of the best narration you'll ever have the pleasure of hearing. <sighs> I love James Marster, so uh, that's gonna definitely... Colleen, going to rock your world. <laughs> okay, I'm there. <laughs> There's the lies of Locke Lamora that I read. I never actually got through the series, though, so... Kate, we may have to rehash those ones as well. Last but not least, Avery, you were telling me about the fantasy, the books that you're reading, but you had a you wanted to weigh in on some fantasy too, about Mistborn, I believe. Yeah, I, I mean, I mentioned that I, I it's actually been a while since I read Mistborn, so like if we did it, I would love to reread that. Um, but uh, no, so I've been. Hyping this one up in the chat a lot, but I recently finished Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. Uh, highly recommend for fantasy fans. It's such a different take on fantasy. Um, and she just recently announced the second one. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and then I've also been working my way through the Sandman comic books. Okay, I hear great things. Sorry, don't mind me. I'm just destroying my bookcase behind me trying to get this bad boy back in. Oh, conveniently have... Dresden Files here. <laughs> I bought it so that I could give it to my mum to read. And I remember I gave it to her when I went to, when I was last in Brisbane 5,000 years ago. And I gave it to her in the afternoon and I said, I'm into this series big time. I'd like you to read it to see if you like it. And she gave it back to me the next morning and she was like, eh. <laughs> Just polished it off in an afternoon. I was like, okay. Um, anyway, we're talking good books here. Uh, Thierry says, wait, did I miss a convo on Dresden Files? Damn dishes. You did. Uh, you are not alone in Dresden Files love. Uh, Colleen here is reading them again. I'm trying to persuade her to listen to them. But I asked the question that you missed, Thierry, is you listened to the series tw twice through or thrice through in how long? It's quite impressive. I think it needs to be said. So you tell me that one. Timey wimey 79 -y. Welcome to Geek Bomb, the mod squad. Lovely to have you. We're chatting books. You listen to them 2.7 times in two years. And there's how many books in the series? 16? 16. So you listen to the 16, 30, 2... 0.75 so like another 10 it's like 44 books in two years ah uh, it's too much math too much math for me uh if you haven't told us what book you're reading please let us know in the chat uh, i'm also going to get back to our conversation about king of scars i do realize that we've been rated twice and we have a bunch of people that are joining us which i'm so thrilled about uh thanks to everyone who's decided to follow we do talk about books a lot, especially in Darcy. <laughs> it's my brother, everyone. My brother's writing his book. He's done the first six chapters, which is so exciting. Do you want me to, oh, what's the Academy, Darcy? And have I gotten you into the Dresden Files yet? Because I think you'd really, really like it. I swear I brought it up with you every single time. 
But Darcy's writing a book at the moment. Uh, the Academy is the name of the book? No, The Academy? The Academy? The Academy? What happened to the older moons? The older moons? The older moon. Oh, wow. This is an exclusive. My brother, who is six chapters in writing his first book, has just announced not only the name of the book, the fact that it's a trilogy and the, na uh, the name of the series is a trilogy and the first book. Yes, Lisa, heard it here first. Hey, Darcy, have you, are you on Discord? Do you want to jump into the chat? If you're on Discord, you can join into the book clap. Book clap. The book chat discussion and talk about it. KP Dopes, exclusive. No, I am not. Do not have it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, dear. <laughs> I just assumed that's what you sounded like when you said it. No, I have not. James McAvoy as Morpheus, Michael Sheen as Lucifer, and Taron Egerton as Constantine, to name a few voices. This is for the Sandman, right? I, I think I bought it to listen to it. I just haven't done it yet. Uh, Dart, I'm guessing you're not reading a book at the moment because you're just very, very consumed. Uh, Stephen in the chat is also, uh, he's a, has written a book and says to you, writing a book is a huge undertaking, but let me know when you're done, I'll pre-order it. How great's that? I've asked to narrate it. I'll have to put on a British accent since it's fantasy. But kind of one of the characters is somewhat inspired by me, T tailored after me a little, a little bit. Dart, would you say one of the characters is emulating? Yeah, you could say that. Darcy has no idea how to write this character, which is really funny because I'm like, she's just awesome. She's really great. She's fantastic. She would be so witty. She would have all these boys sweating bullets. Hi, Jeff12334. Welcome to the Maud Squad and Geek Bomb. We're chatting about books. If you are reading a book at the moment, drop it in the chat what you're reading. Stephen Serrell says Australians have the number one accent. No, oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. It's better than an American accent, though. <laughs> My followers just go, Brr. oops. Uh, well, that is everyone in the book club chat that's told us what they're reading at the moment. We should probably get back on track. Um, we are talking about King of Scars. Some of the talking points that I wanted to bring up. Uh, let's talk about Isaac's story. Um, a lot of us are kind of getting the, the feeling that Isaac's story is the weaker part of the book. Not according to Kate, who thinks that Nikolai is a bit of a dunce now, which I want to hear about. Uh, but these Isaac moments, initially, I thought they dragged on. When I listened back to it the second time, I actually realized that Lee Bardugo's writing has gotten to the point where there is no filler. Because even with Isaac's story, we're learning about his past and we're like, yeah, why do we care? What's going on with this guy? But this is where we get the movements of where politics are at right now. Uh, bye, Stephen. Thank you so much for hanging around in the chat. Hope to see you next week or the week after. Or the week after that. We'll see. But thank you so much. Um, this is where sort of like the pieces of the chessboard are starting to move um, because Isaac's kind of like going, oh, I have to learn about all these things. And because he's new and he's being taught things, the exposition's really surreptitiously coming through him. And then we're also hearing updates. So I didn't really notice it the first time, but we're getting a massive understanding about the wars. We mentioned last week about how uh, Kirch was sweating bullets because uh, I think um, Genovia Zem is building out their own trading route. And so Kirch isn't necessarily necessary to them anymore. Uh, Fjorda and Shu have always had a longstanding history, but now we're realizing that the Shu are framing Fjorda to start this war uh, and that Fjorda is claiming that there is a Lance of, um, uh, what is it called? The Lance of Imitator? Yeah. What is it, Nox? Pretender. Oh, the Pretender. Uh, the Pretender. Oh, that's, yeah. that's it, Lise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Lance of Pretender. Um, but when you hear about the fact, or well, because we know that Nikolov, uh, Nik Nikolai Lansov is a bastard and his father is not the actual king, the throne is up for debate. 
And so he's basically saying that the queen had, uh, you know, had fun with this man a lot. So it's technically Nikolai's brother? Or is he just saying that because he, yeah, if he's the one betting the mum and this is his 100% sibling, the pretender is backed by Nikolai's biological father in Fyodor. But wouldn't he have had to have had relations with the queen for this to be a legitimate heir? Or is he just saying, hey, I stoinked the mum to have Nikolai, but I also have another kid, so let's just put him on the throne. That's not the way that works. Uh, what I'm trying to say, though, is that a lot of information is sort of like the seeds are planted in those chapters. Um, before I didn't care, but the second time I was like, wow, this is super important. Kate says, Isaac's storyline felt closer to Six of, Thro uh, Six of Crows style than anything else in this book, to be honest. He was the wyland of the book. I was going to say he had such wyland tendencies, which is naivety tenfold, you know. I thought Isaac was sort of a tragic figure and an innocent sacrifice. The fact that their story was like almost Shakespearean in how it ended, agree. Avery says, the way Nikolai jumped in at the end and solved the murder like Sherlock Holmes makes me want Lee Bardugo to write a fantasy murder mystery. Agree? Absolutely. Uh, Aaron says, and the pretender is backed by... Oh, yeah, we said that one. Sorry. Uh, don't jump the gun about Nikolai's father. Okay. <laughs> I won't. Ooh. Doesn't need to be legitimate. Just needs to have an excuse for war. Yeah. And so now we've actually really established in these second half of the Isaac chapters what we get out of the next book and this is not the high fantasy part this is we're about to go into a massive open warfare uh and we're seeing sort of like nikolai have to lead that as the king um so uh kate we'll get to that comment in a bit but kate you liked isaac's part because of the six of crows style uh lisa you liked isaac's chapters as well i want to hear everyone from book chat about why you like the isaac chapters and then I want to hear the rebuttal from all those that don't. So, Kate, I'm going to start with you about liking Isaac's chapters. I just felt that it fit more into the story than Nikolai and Soyuz. I mean, Nina's were I still my Nina's storyline was still my favorite. What? Isaac, Isaac was in Ravka. Nikolai and Zoya were in a fucking anime. <laughs> they were. They were like flying through the air yeah talking with, like fight speed lines fighting like a morphing monster yeah oh uh, tony l's like saying i'm lurking because i want to read this i don't want spoilers but i'm hanging out with the volume way down we're just saying some really funny things at the moment you're all good <laughs> all you need to know about this book is that it's get getting overall about a four out of five it's not as good as six of crows but it is better than shadow and bone do with that as you will um the tiny bear creation on wheels from Gr gregory was cute yeah that had total uh ghibli vibes for sure i could picture it i'm like why does he look like that <laughs> oh he has to take the shapes of animals oh but he's on our side right yeah 100 percent. i get that vibe uh but that's you liking those chapters except and uh, but you only like it because it is more in tone and in theme with how, yeah, thank you. Um, That's not the only reason. It felt very um, Shakespearean or Dickensian in that he's, you know, brought up quickly as like this pretender where it's like they don't know where the king is. Like if you take out our perspective of knowing where Nikolai and Zoya are, it's like they don't know where the king is. They have to pretend or it's like the brink of civil war. Yeah. He meets this princess, like falls in love with her, but it turns out like they're playing their own games and she's not even the princess. And yeah. You know, he broke away because he, like, fell in love with this girl. It's like, hey, let's actually marry for love. And then she stabbed him and wasn't even the girl he thought she was. And he wasn't the boy that anyone thought. He. So it was just really, like, a, yeah, like a Prince and the Pauper kind of retelling. So but as I just found it very game. interesting. <laughs> Great comment, where Aaron. It was almost like a power, because we were talking about like power creep with Nikolai and Zoya, where they're, like, fighting gods. But then this is a power down. Yeah. Where he's nothing. He's not a Grisha. He's like, he's nothing. Yeah. And so it was just kind of like seeing, seeing this whole world through the eyes of someone who you know they're gonna die. Like you could see it coming ten miles away. But 
I didn't seeing but it I... through those eyes, kind of like Shadow and Bone was seeing it through Alina's eyes, where she was learning everything for the first time. Yeah. Um, in saying that, I, I mean, I know we're talking about pro Isaac and con Isaac uh, chapters, but who saw this ending coming? With um, Ari, Princess Ari, also not being who she said she was, and she was in the position of the guard. And then the lead guard was the princess the entire time just to fulfill an assassination plot. Did anyone see well, that coming? Yes, to me. Oh, come on. You can go first if you like. Knox, you said you saw it coming? Yeah. I, 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 Queen Amidala, you know, it sort of plugged right into that whole thing where the, the person posing as the princess is not the princess. It's some... Um, I mean, it was also because Isaac was not who he was supposed to be so it was like star-crossed lovers but you know what it's exactly like the whole thing where it's like if you want to steal someone's watch tell them you're going to steal their wallet we were so focused on the fact that isaac was the watch that we weren't looking at the wallet right so that's why i didn't see the airy thing at all um i've got to bring up avery's comment because it is so good I know that Russian speakers were laughing about Grisha basically being the Russian version of Greg. So Lee Bardugo threw in that Grigori was the first Grisha teacher to fix that. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. Uh, Lee said uh, that she did not see that coming at all. Uh, Aaron, I'm always oblivious with the endings. I get too into the story being told and I don't try and let myself think ahead. Yes, I do exactly the same thing. That's why I didn't really see it coming. Kate says, I thought the princess swap was way more interesting than the darkling swap. Agree. Yes. Uh, I like that. Did anyone see the man in a bear suit? <laughs> what? <laughs> um, I was too caught up in the story to see what was coming. Yeah, agree. And I really liked the, like, we are dealing with politics. And I thought that, like, the moment where, you know, he's naive about the fact that the merchant's daughter has thrown herself into the lake to be rescued. And Princess Ari is kind of, like, rolling her eyes being like, didn't you know that was a ploy? And then he's going, wait, how long have you been waiting out here to try and, you know, discover me and have a conversation? And she's kind of like guilty. So it's this thing where it's like there's layers upon layers upon layers to the games that people play in the court. And so if it's like so extreme that Isaac has to be tailored to become the king in times of need, then who's to say that someone committing murder wouldn't do the same thing? It's really, I think that I was a little bit, I, I felt like initially the Isaac chapters were lackluster because I think that technically on the sixth three the sixth book into a, a series in a universe introducing someone new to have a backstory I'm like why are you asking me to care now I kind of take a little bit of a step back instead of being more invested I feel like they have to earn it a little bit more um, and I think that that hurt the fact that the the way that this story wrapped up was some of the best of the book. Like it was really, really well done. And I missed it the first time in a way. I was like, wait, what's happening? She was the princess. She wasn't the princess the whole time. And then listening back when Tamar wanted to have a fight with the guard and you hear this, oh, <laughs> and she's on the ground and she's like, yeah, she's not very good for someone in the guard. I was like, it's right there. <laughs> it's so obvious. Because um, I'm going to forget, I'm going to say that Lee Bardugo's writing is still incredibly incredibly impressive she does so much um foreshadowing in the smallest intricate details so the first time that zoya gets on juris's back she makes a comment of what the scales feel like you know it's these little things that are just in the second read so wonderful to have um oh I so what i was oh yeah go go oh so what i was gonna say is i i saw it coming um no, the reason why is, I uh, keep in mind, I'm not an expert in Russian history, but it reminded me of the story of Rasputin, mm -hmm. who he was like this guy who was like a derelict, and then he just, but he was very charismatic, and he ended up sleeping with, uh, uh, I think it was, I can't remember her name, but she was the queen or, of Russia, and there were rumors that Rasputin's daughter, Anastasia, but we can't say that for certain because, uh, you know, he was, when people took wind of what he was doing, 
he he was assassinated you know like and he it, it was very interesting like the similarities you know what i mean like again not an expert in russian history but it was very similar to that you know like uh decoys and and you know like uh political intrigue and and all that other stuff uh Kate's you know, saying very unassuming Kate says if you want to check out the five-part series of rasputin in the last podcast on the left it's really great so there's a recommendation there um it's interesting how Lisa and both Mich Michelle were saying they Michelle thought that there was something up with her, Princess Yuri. Uh, there were clues that she wasn't what she seemed. I think what would happen is every time we were, because we were in the perspective of Isaac, who's going, I'm a fraud. I feel like, you know, I just want to tell you who I really am. And I'm going through all this double life stuff. That when she's agreeing with him, we're just like, oh, she's just trying to impress him or she's trying to make him feel at ease. It's like, no, 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 she's going through, it's a mirror. They're going through the same thing. And Lisa said, yeah, on the reread, I was thinking, how did I miss this? It's all there. And I think that that's a sign of really, really good writing. Uh, oh, it's a true crime podcast. Com a true crime comedy podcast. Oh, okay. Um, the next part, let's chat about Nina's story. Um, Nina the bisexual. This is when Nina, <laughs> both Nina and Nikolai's story end or feature a level of convenience that I would like to talk about. Nina's story initially, we were like the intro, the reintroduction of uh, Tressel, the um, Matthias's wolf. strange that it was like that convenient hi david from canada sh just says sh sure sure um if now hannah this this woman who's you know when she does something wrong the threat is i'm going to tell your father about it and that's the worst thing ever who's her father oh it just happens to be yalbrum what did you think about this reveal everyone hannah's dad is yalbrum did we see that coming because he's supposed to be left for dead. I thought he'd be back because he was not quite dead when they left him. Okay, so you, you saw that as like definitely... Didn't, didn't see him as, as some major character's dad, though, especially at Grisha. That's quite a twist. Mm -hmm. uh, Aaron, you said you didn't see it coming, but it just makes sense. Yeah, because I felt like that was kind of a unfinished business with, with Nina since Matthias isn't around to hold her back. So I knew he was probably going to come back sooner or later. I just didn't see that it was, oh, by the way, he's the father of, of Grisha who's you know secretly keeping her powers at bay because, you know, the head Grisha hunter Grisha. is... Yeah. yeah, yeah, the head Grisha hunter is, you know, it's, it's a little cliche, but I like it. Yeah. Out of all the cliche stories, I think that it's, this one was a little it's, bit. It's it's kind of like uh, like with X Men or something like that. It's like the you know head people who hate mutants yeah. just happens to have a child who is, or you know, kind of the whole somebody who's against gay people who happens to have a child who's gay and they're I secretly very hiding it because it would ruin their. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Who's like promoting this conversion therapy? Yeah. Yeah. Ex exactly. Yeah. Uh, Kate says, I kind of like the parallel of Brum being like the hardline conservative pushing forth anti-LGBT bills and then having a queer child. This is exactly what that is. Yeah. Um, Colleen, you had something to say on this too? Um, it, it just, um, and I, I don't want to jump ahead or anything, but it, it just seems like there are a number of things that are really convenient or um, coincidental in uh, this story, in this uh, duology. I agree. Um, it's shoehorning a little bit, and there's a very big difference between convenience and clever. And I wish it was a little bit more clever. Like Princess Airy, that was clever. But then the trestle, uh, Kate, you were saying that the Yal Brum being the father was a lot easier to digest than the trassled as being back. Thoughts on that, Kate? Your earlier comment. K K 
kind of. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, good. <laughs> we won't talk about it then. Um, okay. There you go. That's the broom chat. Uh, this is the second time that Nina has gone. Third time. Sorry. Third time that Nina has gone face to face with Yal Broom. The first time when she was captured as a Grisha on the ship. The second time was when she was in the ice court thinking that he wouldn't remember her. The third time she's wearing a different face. Twice in this half of the book, he grabs her chin and looks at her face. And I didn't think that it was the um, a sign of assertion. I thought he was looking for tailor marks. Because as Jenya said in Six of Crows, you can see the tailor marks if you know where to look. You thought he was just being gross, Kate? I actually thought that he was looking for like the marks of tailoring. I was wrong on that one. Uh, of course, Nina has to pretend to be a very well-behaved Fjordan woman. And I wrote in the notes, in parentheses, gross. Uh, even Hannah is disgusted by her ease of deception. But then Nina finds the, a note in Broom's pocket because she's at his house having dinner. Reads a plan about the assassination attempt, keeps that information to herself, but uses the rest of the information to plot against, uh, to, to save the girls and the infants in the factory, which is her mission, her personal mission. Is it the mission uh, of the king? No. Adric and Leonie have been uh, pulled into this big time. Um, then I have like the note about teaching Hannah how to tailor with my mm emoji because we, we spoke about that, but... I, I didn't like the ease in which that very difficult magic is now being just passed on because she's a heart render as well. She's not even a tailor. She's a heart render who's now completely changed herself to look like a man. Uh, I didn't like her burn to the well mother, essentially saying like, why are you horny all the time, bitch, when she was accused of trying to seduce Broom. Oh, you did like it. I was going to say, I really liked that moment. She's like, I know what you're doing, girl. There's really good voice acting in the narration for this part as well. I know what you're doing, girl. For whatever do you mean? It's like, I know that you're trying to get a wealthy, established man and that he is someone of notoriety, so you are trying to basically bed him. He's a kept man. He has a very prestigious wife who's noble of birth and he'll never have a chance. And come back's like, wow, wait, if, like, wait for you to make it instantly about sex. You, you know, you anti-prudish woman. You, yeah. Why are you so horny all the time, bitch? Is really great paraphrasing. Thank you, Kate. Mario takes off, says, Hey, Maud. Hi. We're chatting about books. If you are lurking or in the chat or you're watching and you haven't dropped in the chat the book that you're currently reading, please let us know. Aaron says, Nina is definitely trying to be her best, uh, is definite trying to, trying her best to be Kaz, but is clearly a lot more, um, failures than success due to her only seeing Kaz work without knowledge of how he thinks too much. Yes. I hear what you're trying to say, Aaron. Uh, I don't know how to read. I am three. <laughs> sure. All right. That's amazing. Um, tell your parents I say hi. Um, like out of all the things that you could say, that's, that's, Nina is too emotional to be Kaz, 100%. I really liked what Aaron was saying where it's like um, she only sees the outcome. She doesn't see the, the thought process. So while she's learning a version of what he can do, she's not understanding the genius behind it. So she's bound to make some mistakes from time to time. Although I thought that that was a really quick, quick rebuttal and put the well mother in her place big time. Um this is like this again is like sort of the the spy thriller side of the book where they're rolling out the plan Hannah completely changes herself to look like a soldier um Nina's already kind of like figured out what needs to go on Adric and Leonie are into it uh they have agreed that they need to save uh these women and the babies that have been basically force-fed Jurda until they're addicted uh, and that pregnant women who are addicted to Jurda are passing it on to their children in the bid, I guess, to make super soldiers um, in the long way. But this is a part of the Fjorda process where they are stealing women and turning them into breeding machines and drugging them up, which is kind of like Taken, fantasy Taken. It's not good. 
uh, and Nina's right to want to do something about it. Uh, what I find really interesting here is that um, a couple of things. Uh, when we go through this, the plan's kind of going okay. Fucking Trass, all the wolf shows up again and takes care of some soldiers. Uh, but uh, Broom comes in here. And the big thing that Hannah's been struggling with is that there's no way my father knows about this monstrosity. There's no way. And then Broom basically confesses the entire plan and says, no, they're not, Grisha are not even women. They're not people. They're things. You're no better. I'm going to inject you next. And that's when she's like, donk, he a bad man. Gross. He knew all about it. This is devastating. And Nina's like, I told you and I've been trying to stop him. When the well mother comes in, shit goes weird. Nina has the ability to not only communicate with the dead, but to in a way resurrect them bring them temporarily back to life in like a bit of an army type thing what did you feel about nina's response to the well mother so not only was she the vessel to be able to speak on behalf of these dead women to share their story with the well mother being like you got me addicted and when I was begging for another, you know, I was dying when I was begging for my next fix. Someone else was like, you knew that I was basically infertile, that you kept impregnating me and I kept delivering stillborn babies, like really dark, awful things. And the well mother's like, what's going on? And then, you know, there's dead babies crawling towards her all of a sudden and, you know, the, the undead rise. And Nina parts saying... Give her the mercy, the mercy that she deserves. So unmute if you want to comment about this one. What do you think about this side of Nina? And is it, is this justice? Is this devoid of any emotion? What do you, what do you think about this? I, I feel Kate, that it, Kate. what I'm sorry. No, no, did, did you want someone else to go? Uh, I, I can, I can... <laughs> go, Jimmy, go. Oh, okay. Uh, I feel that it was uh, devoid of emotion. That's just my opinion. Because when reading this part, I was thinking about the uh, Dante's Inferno. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever read the, the great tragedy, Dante's Inferno. But in it, when he's going through hell, he comes across... Um, the, the babies that died in the womb or whatnot. And so it was like very like tragic and very like, uh, I feel like almost dismissive in a way, but that's just my opinion. I was muted. Okay. Um, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, she had to be stone cold in that moment. Uh, Kate, Kate, do you want to talk to me? <laughs> You found your kink. You have found. I feel like I was just talking to only you in that chat. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is starting to be the beginning of a monologue here. Um... Autobot was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, talk me through. You you were aroused. Um during this moment. I don't know. I thought she was real cool and badass and uh -huh. sexy. I don't know. I like villains. So when she was just like stone cold like that, I was like, ooh. This is the thing. It's like when someone has just done reprehensible, horrific things, do you show compassion or do you give them what they dealt out? Is it eye for an eye? Nah. You know? And I think... That's why if I had powers, I would be a villain, I think. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to control, like, my anger and stuff. I wouldn't have compassion. I've definitely gone on record saying that I would only kind of, like, mess with people that were bad, that were doing the wrong things. Give them what they deserve, says Lise. But then it's like, well, who are you to play God in those moments? But it's like, you know, if someone was rude, I'd be like, don't do that. Ugh you know, just teaching little lessons, but that's not my job, but I don't have powers. Um, but we are all Nina is what I'm trying to say, I guess. Mm. All right. So you think it was justified. Uh, does anyone else have thoughts on Nina's, uh, merciless? I, I kind of do. Yeah. Aaron. Yeah. I, I think it actually was absolutely filled with emotions. She was basically doing what she feels like righteous vengeance as 
A, she is hearing the dead literally crying out for justice in her head and the only one, and she's the only one who can actually give them what they can't get on their own. Yeah. So I think she's just trying to be like that like Ghost Rider spirit of vengeance type of moment. And that's what's fueling her. She has no permission to do this. And she has so, to go back to Ravka and she does not want to because this is her calling and she has to destroy this beast, you know? Yeah. Also, she is still grieving for Matthias. So this is kind of like her one step towards revenge. And uh, she, just kind of like 11. I was Sorry, say, she, well, she was able to help him. She got him through it. And so she knows mm -hmm. that it works if she can just attempt, you know? And also just kind of uh, build on what I was saying before about her trying to be Kaz, but not. I think she, the reason why she, you know, is failing as trying to be Kaz is because Kaz was clearly a strategist. He thought so far ahead, he could, you know, easily predict where people were going to go. And she is, you know, just winging it. Like she comes up with a plan, but that's all she's, she doesn't have multiple plans and backups. She just, if this plan works, great. If not, throw away the plan and just make it up as I go. Oh my gosh, Michelle, what a great comment. Usually people know when they're doing a bad things and when you confront them saying, you know, that this is wrong. The bad person's reaction is so telling of their nature because many times no one has called them on their BS. Ooh, -wee. that's a good comment. Uh, so is Jimmy's saying, this is why therapy is helpful, Nina. And a comment that I kind of want to chat about in this one is, and this goes back to Zoya, which we haven't even touched upon and we're like, I only got 10 minutes. Yikes. I know we started late, so maybe we'll go a little bit over just so we could get all the topics out. Um, but Nina and Zoya, Zoya has long-term trauma from childhood. Nina's got new trauma. So she's someone who's usually very vivacious, very confident, uh, so few insecurities, which is a very well-rounded and established person. And then Zoya is absolutely uh, like d destroyed by a traumatic childhood event that she refuses to heal from because her wall and her anger uh, protects her. Uh, and I and I guess my argument with um, Zoya, and I guess we'll move on because we kind of got to the end of the Nina section. Uh, but a big part about Zoya that I didn't like is that she was unnecessarily cruel. She was so cold and she was just just devoid of any sort of empathy, sociopathic in a way. Uh, and I was just really kind of like, just because she's beautiful doesn't mean she gets to be a bitch. But now we've discovered why. She was a child and at nine years old, her mother who married for love realized she effed up and it didn't provide her a comfortable life. So was going to use her beautiful daughter to guarantee that for her. And when a, an old wealthy merchant takes an interest... Are you still listening, Adam? You're still here. How to read. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your gifted sub. How to read is now part of book club. So that's a really good fit. And I appreciate that. <laughs> um, now that we know Zoya's trauma, she's about to be married off at about eight or nine years old to a rich merchant who's not a good person. And the mum is blinded by the fact that this is the right thing to do. And the aunt is saying, what the hell is wrong with you? She's a girl. Get out of this. A couple of things happened when I was thinking about this. That rich people get away with so much shit. This is classism at its finest. And this is the Harvey Weinstein effect where it's like you are absolutely volatile, but you pay your problems to disappear or people excuse it because you can provide a wealth for them that they couldn't before. I am team aunt. You do not, you know, you do not allow bad treatment just because they have money. You do not allow bad treatment because they're beautiful. I just don't believe in treating people badly, which is why if I had superpowers, I would regulate them all. Um, but the other thing that I noticed is that Zoya has permitted and continues to allow the negative response that her trauma provides. And this is where hurt people, hurt people comes from. She's a very, very hurt woman who incidentally hurts others by her coldness, her cruelty, uh, neglect, her um, inconsiderations, because that's her armor. So she chooses to hurt people as a coping mechanism instead of 
uh, being able to process why you're like that, heal yourself from that so that you can protect others from your pain. And I think that that's another reason why it's like, Zoya, girl, you just, you can't hurt other people because you've been burnt. Like that's not how life works. And I think that that's like the, the, the two dynamics of this where it's like Nina has very little trauma. Uh, she got bullied a little bit, but she just continues to love to eat. <laughs> like she's just made her choices and is completely self-assured and adores who she is, but now has this very dangerous power, which she is using for vengeance. Whereas Zoya has realized that power has protected her um, and becoming a Grisha was the thing that saved her from being a child bride which I do understand. And that's the thing with trauma. A lot of it is really understandable. It's not um, it, like, it's not dismissive in a way. It's not like, how dare you? It's like, I totally understand why you would be like that and why you would feel these ways. But every day that you continue to lie, like, um, uh, like sink into that choice and sink into your, your coping, your dangerous or your, your, not vicious or violent, but your your damaging coping mechanisms that hurt other people. You have to be responsible for that, you know. And I think that's what bothered me about Zoya as well. It's like just because you're angry and you're hurt and you had really bad shit happen to you, doesn't excuse you to do it to other people. Anyway, I went on a rant. Let's go back through the chat there. Avery says, "I'm also glad that we got this story of her aunt because that felt like such a throw line in Shadow and Bone." Agree. Also in the show. It's like, oh, my aunt, she's everything to me. You're like, okay. Uh, Aaron said she would rather keep people at arm's length rather than risk the hurt uh, that letting other people in would bring. It's not only that. It's not that she's keeping them at arm's length. Anyone who's close gets stung. Like, it's not that you're safe. Like, you're not safe around her because she's permanently pushing you back with pincers, if that makes sense. And there's a difference. There's a difference between not being warm and welcoming and um, inviting you in. And there's like keeping people back in like a, a vicious way. Uh, yeah. And Colleen says it's a way of keeping others at distance. Uh, Kate says, God, she had given a, uh, she had herself given away to a man as a child and her aunt saved her. She gave herself away to an old rich man and he killed that same aunt that saved her the first time. So she's probably full of, self-hatred and resentment as well even though the darkling didn't look old and i guess she didn't really know that about him but the first guy that she trusted killed the woman that saved her yeah uh maybe that's why dating's so difficult so much baggage well uh, there you go jimmy yeah but don't worry guys like to rescue women that's what i've learned that's why i'm single nothing to rescue it's annoying um Avery says, Nikolai's line about hate that stems from devotion being the strongest form of pain. That was good. I agree. Uh, Aaron says, I think Zoya has lived with her trauma for too long that to let it go became extremely hard. Yeah, it completely became her identity. Absolutely. Kate says, you have to find someone who is willing to put your baggage in their trunk along with theirs. Not necessarily carry it for you because that's, the terrible, that's a terrible burden to put someone el uh, on someone else but they have to acknowledge that you have it and accept it. But there's this thing where it's like, it's, it's like saying I have, um, I, I have acidic vomit. So every time I eat cheese, I vomit up acid. It's what I do. Like, just accept that. And it's like, have you ever thought about not eating cheese? No, no, no. I'm just going to eat it and I'll vomit up acid and you might get burnt and it might deform you. But I've told you about it. There's such a difference between like, you know, going to the root of the problem and actually trying to, to heal it i've also been in therapy for a very long time um and my mom's a psychologist i think that's where i get a lot of this from as well uh colleen says nikolai is the only when i'd say a long time it's been four years it's been four years uh colleen says nikolai is the only one that she seems to trust at this point maybe because she recognizes the darkness in him colleen i want to talk about that unmute let's chat about that comment because that's really good well, he's got this darkness in him that he's trying to hide and cope with. And um, he trusts her with that. But I think she recognizes this darkness because I think there's been so much darkness in her life. 
So I, I think it's a level that they can communicate on uh, that no one else can. Does that explain why she was so infatuated with the Darkling? Because he admired that side in her? Oh, I think that's a good point. Yes. Um, he, he not only accepted her the way she was, but used her for that. Um, he saw it as a strength. Yeah. And I think Nikolai really does too. He, he sees her ruthlessness as good leadership. Like he, there's a qualities that he really likes in her about not fussing over him, pandering to him. Like he's going to get it real from her no matter what. She likes the fact that he's not oogling at her, that apparently like, you know, her physicality seemingly has no effect on him and he doesn't show it any time that it does. Um, I think there's something about uh, Zoya's survival mechanism was power equals protection. And the Darkling was the most powerful person. And so she went to his side thinking that it would be protection. But the fact that they were intimate together, she, she sought a lot of validation and approval from the Darkling, which I found very interesting. And he threw it back in her face because he kind of killed his, her, uh, her aunt along with wiping out the entire city. Um, I'm wondering if there is a part of Nikolai that she still wants to be around because he is still one of the most powerful people in the world, being a king. He's powerful, but he also has a very human side. Um, he, he has a political mindset, but um, he never forgets people as people. Um, he he seeks the humanity and those around him. Um, I think the way he reacted to Isaac's death showed a lot of that. Mm. Did, did I get ahead? No, no, that's good. Uh, she, I'm just trying to remember, Jenya was dismayed. Jenya was mortified that it happened. Zoya didn't even know who Isaac was. That's all right. Uh, moving on to Kate's comment, because I kind of relate to it in a way. I've often been described as being cat-like in that I'm very aloof when I first meet people because I'm keeping them at a distance because I have thick walls around me and I choose who I open up to on my own terms, but I don't actively be cruel to people. That last line is the most important line. You don't actively be cruel to people. Uh, I observe. I do a thing where I observe and if I'm in a social scenario, I will either say something a bit cheeky or a little a little quick or a little inappropriate to see how I can gauge their response. If their response is, then I don't have to waste my time anymore. And I kind of say it like I'm, I'm starting a, a game of tennis and I hit the ball. And I just want to see if they hit the ball back. That's all it is, to see if I can have a game of tennis with someone. And it's, you know, emotional compatibility. Uh, and if they go, oh, you just hit a ball at me. I go, okay, cool, awesome. I get to not have to be a part of that anymore. Um, but if they go whoosh, whoosh, and they hit one back and I'm like, I'll either try to hit it back, but sometimes I'm so surprised and I'm like, oh my gosh, you just bested an ace there. Like you got me back. This is really cool. You're worth it. I'm going to, you're someone that I want to chat with because we're on the same wavelength. Apparently that's called testing people when you first meet them and we shouldn't do that. <laughs> but that's something that I would do. So Kate, I get you in that one. Uh, and the inappropriate side of it is not like offensive in any way. It's just to kind of like provoke a response, I guess. Aaron says, I think why she likes Nikolai, though, is that he accepts the thorns rather than trying to prune them. This is such a great analogy considering the entirety of the book. What offense? That's the best. That's the best sort of like pun theory yet. Gold star Aaron. Well done. Kate says, I'm always civil Thank and polite. You. Yeah, that was really good. Um, did you mean to use the analogy of like how Zoya kills Elisabetta? Kind of, yeah. I was like thinking, like, well, they're in the giant, like, thorn bush, you know, forest or wherever, and then a giant fight with that. So, it, yeah, it kind of fit with the theme. That's, that's she was always kind of like a very prickly person. I think, I 
don't recall where it was, but there was this whole analogy, I think, with Nikolai about, you know, people like flowers, so they'll try to avoid the, the thorns, whereas I think he was using it with Zoya, but she is the clearly the thorns. Yeah. And the flowers are just there, but it's the thorns that you have to kind of yeah. focus on. Yeah. Um, uh, Miss Necromancer says, I would never be called cuddly. I would never be called friendly. I would never be, and I've come to terms with that. I would be called funny. I'd be called quick. I don't think I would ever be called friendly. Friends of mine have disagreed, but I don't know. I'm, I'm just, my core value is authenticity. So I'm never going to be like, oh my God, hi, if I don't mean it. And most likely I don't mean it. So I won't, I won't ever do that. <laughs> um, so because of that, Kate says, I can relate to Zoya on a deep level in that way, but not in her cruelty for no reason. And that is the only thing I have a problem with. Like, she will make people feel so shit about themselves. Why does this king want to marry you? Why did he give you the emerald? It should be me. What? That's mean. <laughs> That's really rude. So many things. Like these uh, throwaway comments about Adric losing his arm that I would gasp at reading. I was like, that's so not cool. That is not cool. Like she just oversteps the line. Kate and I know where the line is. Zoya doesn't. And that's my problem that I have. Avery says it's trauma bonding. Ain't that real? That definitely happens. That's usually how people can connect on an intimate level because they both have their shit that they want to share and they accept each other's shit. Uh, Aaron says his darkness isn't just the literal demon, but also his trauma of being in war and combat, seeing his friends die around him. Also him not being accepted by his family and trying to find a place for himself. Holy shit. When they had that moment where the Darkling kind of like forms his basically regurgitates his inner uh, insecurities and weaknesses and all the things that he's afraid of. And Darkman's like, I see it all. I know exactly who you are. You're afraid of me. You should be afraid of you. And Nikolai's like, shit. Yeah, it was a really um, confronting moment for him, for sure. Michelle says, Zoya's experiences also taught her that no one is universally owed your niceness or even your kindness. The expectation to receive kindness from others can be very presumptuous depending on where that expectation is rooted. I agree with that. Um, there was a part in that which I really understood. And that was when she went back into Novi Zem uh, and she was just obviously like so devastated because her aunt died. And this man goes, smile, we're alive, you should be happy. And she sucks the air out of his lungs and says, you smile. You can't breathe right now. Go, smile. Um, I was like, yeah, I would probably do that too if someone told me to smile. Like, So I get what you're saying in that comment, Michelle. No one is owed your niceness. And I think that that's the difference. No one is owed niceness or kindness, but it really should be somewhat of a default. Consideration should be a basic human decency. Uh, Chris says, what do you think about the cover of King of Scars? Will a book cover ever entice you to read it? Hmm, because this is the double-headed eagle that we keep hearing more and more about. Um, that's a great question. I'd love everyone to weigh in on that. Would a book cover ever entice you to read it? There are some that look a little sappy, but because of audiobooks, like, n it's really less of a deterrent for me. Does anyone have any thoughts on the never judge a book by its cover? <laughs> well, generally, when I look at a book, uh, you know, actual book, not the metaphorical book, they, uh, uh, you, it, it doesn't really sway me to uh, read the book. More like, uh, it's like when you buy a video game, you know, you go over to, you look at the back of it, you're not really getting the gist of the video game. That's why you want to play the demo or something first. So you're like, okay, this game is for me. Otherwise, yeah. you end up returning the game or something. But audiobook has samples, which is like, I guess, the better version of the cover, right? Yeah, you could say that. Yeah. Colleen, you said, I mean, Avery, sorry, you said, oh, yeah, I have definitely judged books by their covers. <laughs> Colleen, do you want to um, jump in? Well, just... Uh... So many of my books are on Kindle that um, that's usually not a big issue with me. 
Um, I look more at the blurbs uh, about the book or the synopsis to get an idea about it. I think there have been times when um, I've been lured into buying a book just because of the cover. But for the most part, I look at um, recommendations and I look at uh, at the, the blurbs or the synopsis that that someone posts. Yeah, I agree. It's the, it's the content. So to answer your question, Chris, although Avery, do you have anything to add to judging books by its covers? Is there a horror story or something that you haven't read because it had a dodgy cover? Sarah Lee, uh, like, because I will... Uh, like, I don't just judge them by their covers, but I do, I've noticed that, like, when I'm browsing, if a book has a pretty cover, I'm more likely to pick it up and read the back, um, than to just, like, please on buy it, and I do have experience with reading books that have terrible covers and them being terrible, so, right, right. I mean, uh, yeah, it's not always like that, but, um, yeah, <laughs> definitely plays a role in determining whether I pick it up or not. <laughs> yeah, I hear you on that. Like if it looks like someone's, you know, nephew made it um, for a year nine project, yeah, I'd probably avoid it a little bit. Uh, I'm more likely to judge a bottle of wine's label than I am a book's cover, I think. Uh, Kate continues the conversation about uh, relating to Zoya with, I'm okay with not having a lot of friends and keeping people distant. I don't think I've ever felt lonely in my entire life. And I think that says something deeply psychologically wrong with me. No, it doesn't. Um, let me know, Kate, if this phrase relates to you. Because when I, I remember someone gave me like my birth chart where it's like, if you're born around this time on this day, blah, blah, blah. Here is you in a paragraph. And I was like, no, no, no. And then right at the end, it said, often alone, yet never lonely. And I was like, <gasps> and I'd felt so sad. I've heard that before, and it's absolutely accurate. Yeah. The pandemic did not affect me at all, except for like work-related things, but psychologically and emotionally, it did not affect me at all. There is a very, very big difference um, between being alone and being lonely. And I hear you on that. I hear you on that. So I don't think there's anything wrong with you as well. I think you prioritize quality over quantity in terms of friendships. And I feel like if you're going to let someone in, that they need to be someone that you do trust and you need to have a quality, yeah, a quality version of a friendship before that can happen. I have, I'm exactly the same. So I would rather have three really, really good friends than 30 acquaintances any day, any day. And I kind of do. So here you go. Um, uh, oh, you have a work persona. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep, I hear that. Um, but you continue saying, part of me wishes that I could be like Zoya, though. She's so damn confident and sharp, and sometimes I would like to not overthink everything because of my anxiety uh, and just be rude and have it not matter. She, that's the thing, though, and that's the compassionless side of it where she honestly doesn't care. She doesn't care if she's hurting someone's feelings. She doesn't care what they think of her. She doesn't care what they're saying. The thing with Zoya, though, is that she can always fall back into her beauty because it excuses so much of that. And I think that that really takes a lot of pressure out of caring about what other people think. Um, and that's just not a luxury that most of us have. Um, I think quality of friendship is so much more important. Oh, yeah, there you go. Colleen said exactly what I said. There you go. Um, you oh this poem remember what you must do oh what is this poem about aaron tell me about the poem oh i was uh uh and the cartographer when she was like you know you don't deserve people's kindness just because you ask for it kind of thing it reminded me of this poem uh i found on like something read on tiktok and i even gave the video on discord uh, it says remember what you must do when they undervalue you when they think your softness is your weakness, when they treat your kindness like it is their advantage, you awaken every dragon, every wolf, every monster that sleeps inside you, and you remind them what hell looks like when it wears the skin of a gentle human. Wow, that's great. Yeah. And that's kind of what they were talking about in the book too. I love that. 
every dragon. It kind of embodies yeah. Zoya a little bit, especially now that she is basically a dragon. And she had the tiger <laughs> instead of a wolf, but it turns out our boy here might be a yeah. wolf too. Is that a Pi is that a Pisces thing? <laughs> Don't feel lonely at all. <laughs> I love that we're getting into star sign. I'm a Pisces with a Capricorn moon. Oh, there you go, Miss Necromancer. Maybe it's the Capricorn moon. No, wait. Oh, I'm Aquarius rising. Yeah, Capricorn moon. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not really, um, I don't understand it all so much. I don't really get it. Uh, I With Chinese zodiac, I'm year of the tiger. <laughs> uh, uh, Colleen says, I also think that uh, she also feels like no one was nice to her, so she doesn't need to be nice to anyone. Her beauty lets her get away with it, but I'm not sure if that's a real motivation. Hmm um okay so let's talk about the fact that we just went to mushroom town uh zoya has encompassed the power of the dragon elizaveta was using yuri because she had her own motive to resurrect the darkling didn't think nikolai would survive but he did because of zoya uh and with that she pins him down very jesus on the cross but that's fine um and then Zoya, having new abilities, manages to wipe Elisabetta out. Yuri does survive. Basically, the Darkling's entity goes into him. Nikolai survives. They all leave. Bada bing, bada boom. End of the book. Spoiler. If you haven't read this, bugger off because I'm going to spoil everything. The Darkling is now in Yuri's body and he's basically completely transformed. Nox, this is what wrecked the book for you. Why don't you like this moment? It just seems so contrived, and it's sort of like, well, wait, I thought we were done with him. So it, it's just effect. sort of too convenient again, yeah. No one ever really dies, you know? And this is what's really hard, where it's like, what was the fucking point of a trilogy to take out the antagonist if he's just going to come back two books later? What's the point? <laughs> What does everyone else I, feel about? Yeah, Colleen, go, go, go. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It was um, it was so emotional um, at the end when uh, Alina was saying goodbye to um, Alexandra. A and this is another place that I thought the, um, the show kind of fell down. They made his name just seem like, oh, yeah, everybody knows his name. Um, but it was so personal in the book and there was something so tender about her um, really beginning, I don't know if forgiving so much as understanding him and recognizing some of the pain he'd been through. And now that's just kind of all gone out the window and we've got the darkling back and woohoo, I fooled you all, here I am. Yeah. And the fact that we're introduced to these saints and they're like, well, have you heard about the Darkling? No, oh, we don't really care about him. No, I've got a shrine made in his honor and he's going to be the one that saves me. It's like, what the fuck ever. Uh, Lisa, you were mad at it as well. You're not a fan of the ending of this book. Talk me through it. You there, Lisa? Avery, what do you think about the ending of the book? Um, I kind of have, I don't know, two thoughts on it. Like, on one hand, I do kind of feel like it made the ending of uh, Shadow and Bone trilogy kind of pointless. But also, this entire book was about them dealing with, like, the trauma of everything that the Darkling did to them. So I feel like it was used as a tool to kind of... I don't know, obviously we haven't seen much of him, but we just saw those last two pages, but it's like they are trying to, it's like it's going to help them, I, I feel like it's setting up, like it's going to help them like get um, more, or like, I don't know. They're going to try to contain him as a weapon or a resource to try and win this war, but like have him yeah, work for like, them. Yeah, give them, like, the ability, like, the chance to kind of get through all of the terrible things that 
happened to them that they've been talking about this whole book. Know, it's like, and then forgive like they finally have the chance of dealing with it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. But <laughs> I'm just so distracted by the chat. <laughs> Kate kicking it off with like the Darkling 2. Oh no, not again. And then Aaron saying Darkling 2, the electric revenge. And then Kate saying Darkling 2, Rav could drift. And then Aaron saying Darkling, too dark, too furious. And then Jimmy says, oops, I Darkling again. <laughs> again, it's very good stuff. It's very good stuff. Oh, man. Did anyone like this? Is anyone excited to have the Darkling back in Yuri's body? Crickets. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I was excited. Uh, it, it. I know that this book had nothing to do with a heist, yeah. but I feel like the ending was stolen from us. Yeah. Yeah, it got hijacked for sure. What do you think, Max? Well, I just, I, on further thought, once I accepted the fact that he was back and whether I liked it or not, is he here back for redemption or is he back to mess stuff up again? You know, it's like, haven't we had enough trouble from you? Yeah. Agree. I Colin. just hope it doesn't pull a, a sorry, I no, no, jumped the gun, Aaron. but I, I'm hoping they don't pull a Palpatine. Oh, oh like, my God, that's what it's feeling like, isn't it? A little bit. Yeah. Only less clone and just more, hey, look, I, I body snatched. Oh. Yeah, it, it seemed pretty contrived to me. Uh, it's kind of like, oh, we had this really great villain. Uh, we need to bring him back because he was such an awesome villain a instead of kind of moving on. Yeah, and it, it really does sort of like, um, what's the word I'm after? It, oh, hello, Endless Pastrami. Thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to Book Chat. I'm talking about this book here. Uh, it, so, it sort of um, oh, takes all the value out of the first trilogy. It makes all of it pointless. Um, and, you know, Alina was hanging up her medallion, basically, hanging up all her, her responsibilities because she did the one thing that needed to happen. And then it's like, well... <gasps> He is back, and this time, it's not personal. <laughs> Avery loving the chat as much as I have been. I literally have tears forming. It's so good. Uh, <laughs> I'm here to steal bodies and chew bubble gum, and I'm all out of gum. <laughs> uh, Michelle says, I kind of thought it was inevitable with all the Darkling-related stuff that was in this book. It felt like the end was asking, uh, was, was kind of asking, what would you do if you could uh, confront your abuser? Oh, wow. What a good take on that that's such an interesting perspective and we definitely needed that because we're all out of gum so thank you uh, i feel like it's kind of pandering to the fact that the audience thinks he's hot says kate mm, uh, yeah uh yeah something's up I, I think i also felt a little bit funky about that there were two male saints one's a dragon and one's like a shape-shifting bear who was like the creator of everything gregory hardly got like any notoriety for the fact that he was like the one who started it all and then out of all of them it was elisaveta that used a man to get back at a woman i was like oh this is not great um oh avery was trying to say that there you go good 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 uh, from that point, I agree. Zoya Load needs the catharsis, especially now that she has much more power than before. This is going to be a showdown, isn't it, between the Darkling and Zoya? Because Zoya is harnessed by like the centuries of or millennia of knowledge of Juris. Yeah. The woman's the evil one. Exactly. Elizaveta felt very evil queen. Mm -hmm. I think we're on the same page with that as well. I uh, may have to wrap this up though. We are a little bit past our time. Thank you. That was so much fun. The chat, we need to do like little title competitions or something. That was great. I feel like I've definitely, we're in good company with just those sorts of ridiculous puns. So thank you. Avery said, I did assume that Elizabeth was going to have a connection to the Darkling though, because he's got a bad track record with powerful women. Ooh, he has possibly been grooming her. That's an interesting take too. He does harness and groom powerful women, 
break them down to think that they are unnecessary and need him, you are onto something. She had cool imagery though. Roses and bees are a dope visual. The way that Lee Bardugo described these blossoming and then wilting flowers all over her dresses. Yeah, it was stunning. And I remember thinking, I just want to see that because that would look so beautiful and like you know harnessing the thorn wood yeah amazing the chronicles of darkling the king the dragon and the useless monk incel as we've been calling him very funny indeed also aaron if you keep posting all these book talks i'm gonna have to start making them aren't i i'm gonna have to start any ideas that anyone has for some book talks um yeah maybe i should could even read out all of those titles in one maybe four people will get it but it's very funny uh, yes, stained glass. Yes, in this sort of like the Citadel Cathedral-esque type thing. Book talk loves smart. Maybe we got to do this, Lise. Maybe we got to talk to our talk to our people. Talk about that fay fucking. <laughs> anyway, yes, I agree, Gory. This was an awesome book chat. Thank you so much. Uh, we are done for the book for the month. I said it, Adam. I said it. Um, we are done for this book. The next book will be Rule of Wolves. And then we are done with the Grisha verse. Mikey says it was a great book. Hey. Yep. We're done with the Grisha verse after the next one. Don't. Uh, yeah, she has already written more apparently. Oh, there's going to be another Crows book? Shit. Uh, that's so awesome. I'm stoked for that. Uh, it sounds like also next we're thinking Miss Bourne trilogy. Uh, maybe getting a Wheel of Time book done, even though we did the first one for Geek Bomb book chat a while ago, so we'd probably have to pick up from the second one. Um, I really want to do Last Unicorn. We, I mean, I want Nerdist to do um, the second uh, Name of the Wind book, uh, Wise Man's Fear. I'll probably leave that for Nerdist since we started that already. Um, but yeah, we have to plan out the rest. If you do have points, you can guide the raid. Absolutely. We should do a couple of Dresden, break up Dresden with other books in between. I think bouncing back between contemporary supernatural noir and like a high fantasy could be a really good bounce around. Uh, we're absolutely going to do The Last Unicorn. So yeah, so many books, so little time. I know, I know, but this was a lot of fun. Uh, has, is anyone going to guide the raid? Who we got online? the dungeon runs doing a game of dungeons and dragons uh jason charles miller's got a music performance that's always a good time who do we want to raid anyone what's we wants to do uh don't forget the light of the jedi i have to double check the light of the jedi the light of the the light of the the light of the jedi that's what it is, The Light of the Jedi by Charles Soule, S-O-U-L-E. Steph Woodburn again. I would love to. Steph Woodburn's fan freaking tastic. Uh, Steph. Steph's raided a few times, which is great. Steph Woodburn playing The Last of Us? No, playing Fortnite, what I can see. Can someone help me with that? Are they playing the last? Oh, you're saying Feral Wife. Sorry. No, nope. guys, Fortnite with uh, Steph Woodburn. She's raided Geek Bomb quite a few times. So let's drop some bombs and show some Geek Bomb love there. Are we all ready? Let's hope they get a win in. Uh, Light of the Jedi is a book that we are going to read for Nerdist Book Club. So that's going to be the last Wednesday of the month. Next week's off so that you can read. And then I'll see you with the Nerdist crew on. I'll give you a date if that helps. It'll be 5 o'clock on the 28th of the month. And we've already got our next book picked for next week, uh, next month. Bye, guys. Thank you. Let's drop some bombs. Pow, 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 pow. Good night, everybody. <laughs>